Hi everybody. Today we're going to talk about definitional issues in white collar crime. As we talked about uh, previously, there is a um, a pretty large debate, or at least there was a pretty large debate about whether or not white collar crime was actually crime, because there there were no criminal prohibitions against uh, certain behaviors. Certain behaviors were not. Um, viewed as a violation of criminal statutes. And so a lot of people said, while they might be morally um, abhorrent, they're not necessarily criminal. Edwin Sutherland obviously is the first person who kind of pushed back on this argument. So Edwin Sutherland, um, as already discussed, was the president of the American Sociological Society when he proposed this idea of white-collar crime. And Edwin Sutherland is arguably one of the most influential criminologists in the 20th century, because not only did he come up with and develop this new type of criminality, he also proposed a new theory to help explain this and other types of criminality that has really had a lasting impact on the field. So what was Sutherland's main argument? Basically, what he argued was that crime statistics show that crime is committed by lower classes. Therefore, criminological theories all suggest that poverty and lower class status caused this deviance. Because of that, these theories were also tested with lower class populations. So it, you should be, for those of you who have taken research methods before or have a basic understanding of research methods, there should be all sorts of red flags going off in your mind here. All right, so if the crime statistics show that crime is committed by lower class people, we develop a theory saying lower class um, status or poverty cause crime and then test these theories using only lower class populations. Well, we've kind of entered into an echo chamber there a little bit, right? So we're using a biased sample to test bias theories based on potentially biased crime statistics. And so if the theories are tested using bias samples, the theories inherently themselves are biased. And that's basically what Sutherland argued is because of this kind of in a sociology of law kind of way, because of how the laws were created, wealthy people were not subject to the same rules and regulations as non-wealthy or non-powerful people. Sutherland continues by suggesting that every field has deviance in it, right? And if you ask anyone, and if you just think about this in general, it's, uh, it's obviously true, right? Ask anybody what crooked practices are found in your occupation. It doesn't matter if you talk to a doctor, a lawyer, a pharmacist, a teacher, a college professor, um, jobs that college students typically have, right? Working in retail or, or in the service industry in some capacity. If you say what crooked practices are found in your occupation, you sitting at home are probably sitting there nodding your head going, yeah, I can think of some things. And if you haven't had a job yet or anything, if you ask your parents, what are some of the sketchy things people do at your job that may or may not be legal, they could probably easily start rattling off a bunch of ideas. And so because of that, right, Sutherland argues if every job has crooked practices in it, right, then there's a lot of deviance that we're not really measuring and looking at. Sutherland goes on to argue that there's not really a huge difference between what the mafia did and what business leaders do. So, for example, the mafia owned unions, uh, trade unions, and also controlled a lot of the shipping in New York. So if they didn't get the contracts they wanted, if, if things didn't go their way, they would either shut down the, the construction industry, the garbage industry, or they would just close the ports of New York, which has potential to have ripple effects on the whole U.S. economy. Substantively, is that really any different than a senator going to a campaign owner or a contributor or donor and saying to them, hey, donate a bunch of money to my campaign and I'll make sure when we build this road, we hire your construction company? Is there really anything different about that? Also, what about legal practices that aren't in the best interest of the consumer? So, for example, and this is not... Um, uh, necessarily allowed today as often, but at the time, one of the big things that was happening was fee splitting between primary care physicians and surgeons. So what a primary care physician would do is someone might come in and say, oh yeah, my back hurts a little bit. They'll refer them off to an orthopedic or neurosurgeon. The neurosurgeon then gives the primary care physician a little cut for the referral and basically says, you keep referring people to me, I'll keep giving you a little cut, that way I can bill insurance and you can bill insurance, and maybe even perform a surgery or two out of this. So that's clearly not in the best interest of the patient. Is that illegal? Should that be illegal? So Sutherland also talks about how white-collar offenses cost the American people several times more than violent and property crimes cost the American people. 
Uh, for example, uh, he points to a grocery store embezzler who, who stole $600,000 from this grocery store, which was six times the amount stolen from all the grocery stores in the same chain in that year. So one executive embezzling money actually cost the grocery store more than every single person who tried to steal apples or grapes or anything else from that grocery store chain in the whole year. Not just one store, but in the same chain in that year. That's huge. One crooked executive. There's an estimated loss from one investment uh, right before the stock market crash into uh, 29 to 35 was about $580 million. And that's because 75% of the portfolio was dependent on securities in affiliated companies. And so while this image here is a little small, what you can see here is that we've got the parent company that does business with the subsidiary and the second subsidiary. So 100% of what that parent company does is sell stuff to these other companies that they own. Those companies then sell stuff to each other, right? Well, what happens if the parent company goes out of business? If the parent company goes out of business, all of those other companies then also go out of business, right? And that's a huge problem, right, for portfolios. You think you have a diversified stock um, uh, investment portfolio, right? You have five different companies that are, maybe they're in the same industry, but they're, you've diversified. So if one goes out of business, it shouldn't affect all the others. But in reality, one going out of business could completely crash your entire portfolio. I would encourage you after this lecture to uh, go back and watch these YouTube videos. Um, this is kind of a modern example of white collar crime, uh, based on, uh, the, um, the Big Short, the movie with uh, Steve Carell and Ryan Gosling and a bunch of other people, um, about the housing market uh, crisis. While it's complicated, obviously this housing market crash was the the cause of the greatest financial housing uh, crisis in American history. But but the question becomes: Is this criminal though? When the subprime mortgage issues developed, was this an issue of buyer beware? People knew they were buying houses they couldn't afford. People knew that, that um, they shouldn't really qualify for the mortgages they were getting. Is it the bank's fault for taking a chance on them, or is it their fault for applying for mortgages that they had no business applying for in the first place? Sutherland would argue, clearly this is the bank's fault. So Sutherland continues to talk about how the larger the financial cost is uh, – the larger the financial cost is, right, the cost to the consumer trust and confidence is even greater. And in large part, this is because when there's a big crash, like for example, in 2008, when the housing market crashed, there was less trust in the stock market and in investing in general, right? If there's less trust out there, people tend to hoard their money, right? We're not sure what's going to happen, so we would rather have our money. We're not going to invest it. Well, less investment, especially in businesses, means businesses can't keep employees, right? So businesses start laying people off, right? You can't get jobs anymore. In fact, jobs get lost. When jobs are lost, the economy gets weaker, right? And with a weak economy, social disorganization happens. Social disorganization is an issue because we know that when social disorganization is high and collective efficacy is low, crime tends to increase, right? So Sutherland makes this big point that less trust, this, this crisis that happens erodes public trust and eroding public trust is one of the biggest predictors of um, a weak economy and social disorganization. If you even think, uh, fast forwarding from 08 to the coronavirus issue that's going on, there, there are um, a lot of people that have lost their jobs because of coronavirus, right? There's a lot less trust and in fact, CNN uh, published an article that talked about how um, in 2020, in the month of March, there was about a trillion dollars Americans saved, which was significantly more than Americans typically save. How was it, did Americans all suddenly get a bunch of jobs? No, they stopped investing. They stopped spending their money because they were so nervous about what was going to happen with the coronavirus. And that had long-term effects on jobs, the economy, and also crime. So how does Sutherland define crime? He argues that other agencies and criminal courts must be included in defining crime. This is one of the big contentions. Some argue, well, if it's not a criminal violation or a criminal statute violation, it can't possibly be a crime. 
Sutherland says that's not true. We need to include other things. For example, juvenile courts are not under the criminal jurisdiction, but yet when juveniles commit crimes, they're, they're taken to juvenile court. The same thing should be true for the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission's violations. They should still count as crime. Sutherland continues and suggests that behavior that would have a reasonable expectancy of conviction should be defined as criminal. It doesn't matter if you were convicted of the crime or not. It just matters if you committed the crime. Criminologists routinely use self-report surveys, not official crime records, right? The self-report surveys show that there's a lot more crime than the police arrest people for. If that's okay when testing theories, why can't we look at civil remedies, which may be more attractive to the victim, right? We can't arrest and convict Walmart, but we can charge Walmart three or four million dollars. If I'm victimized by Walmart, I'd rather Walmart pay me a bunch of money than Walmart go out of business, right? Because I at least benefit in some capacity from my victimization. Um, sometimes conviction is avoided due to pressure on the court. That doesn't mean that a crime isn't um, happening, right? <clears throat> There's all sorts of examples where we just don't quite have enough evidence to convict someone. Does that mean the crime didn't actually take place? Of course not. Sutherland also suggests that accessories to crimes should be included as criminals as in other crimes, right? So if I'm the getaway driver in a, in a drive-by, right, I still can get convicted and charged with those homicides that take place. However, oftentimes in white-collar offenses, we don't actually look at or consider the accessories to the crime. So, Sutherland also suggests that normal crimes have punishments that we're all aware of, like fines, prisons, and death, right? Basically, there's three things that can be taken away from you um, through due process, right? Life, liberty, property. Death, prison, fines are, are life, liberty, property. Right? White collar crimes typically have punishments of warnings, cease and desist orders, fines, or a loss of a license in, in certain medical cases and legal cases, right? These differences cause the public to view them differently. And if we think about it, that makes sense, right? If I'm driving down the street and I'm going 60 miles an hour over the speed limit, so let's say I'm going down um, I 95 and I'm going 120 miles an hour, if I get pulled over, the, the police officer has a choice. They can either arrest me for reckless driving or they can write me a, a really, really big ticket. Let's say they decide to write me a ticket. I go home and I, I say to my wife or my, or my parents or something, hey, I got a ticket. They're not going to be happy necessarily, but they're going to view that very, very differently than if they suddenly get a collect call from the local jail that has me saying, hey, I got arrested. Can you come pick me up? Right? So because even though the act was exactly the same, the punishment that was doled out was different, which causes us to view the act differently, right? And so um, – and if you think about this also, uh, another example of this is, is driving under the influence, right? Self-report surveys suggest a lot more people drive under the influence than arrest rates indicate, right? We are much more judgmental of the people who get caught driving under the influence than the people that we know have probably driven under the influence of alcohol. Now, again, I'm not condoning that behavior. I'm just pointing out that the punishment for the behavior causes us to change our perception of the behavior in pretty drastic ways. There's also a power struggle present in defining and enforcing white-collar crime, and this is where sociology of law kind of comes into the white-collar crime debate, right? Who are the white-collar offenders? Typically, these are people that are powerful, wealthy people in businesses or in politics. They're the ones that are helping make the laws and enforce the laws. If that's the case, probabilistically, the people in power are not making laws that are going to disadvantage them. If I had a classroom of students and I got three students to come up to the front of the classroom, I said, hey, we're going to make some rules for this class. We're going to decide what kind of exams we want. We're going to decide what kind of assignments we want. Is that going to be a fair representation of what the class wants? Probably not. Probably what's going to happen is those three students are going to say, what do I like the best? Maybe those students all prefer essay exams. So every exam is going to be an essay exam. Maybe they hate true-false questions on exams. So there's going to be no true-false questions. Is that representative of the class? Of course not. Those with the power are the ones making the rules, and therefore they make the rules in the light most favorable to themselves. Daniel Drew was a contemporary of people like Henry Flagler and John Rockefeller and John Jacob Astor, um, the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies, right? And 
um, he was kind of in this robber baron age of millionaires and billionaires um, at the turn of the last century. And he's quoted as saying, law is like a cobweb. It's made for flies and the smaller kinds of insects, so to speak, but lets the big bumblebees break through. When technicalities of the law stood in my way, I've always been able to brush them aside easy as anything. So basically, yeah, the laws are there, but, but the laws are there to make sure the little guys pay attention and follow the rules. The laws aren't there for me. If, if the law ever gets in the way and holds me back, I just push it off to the side and, uh, and move on because I'm one of the powerful people. So Sutherland kind of discusses how um, a lot of – so we have this idea of white-collar crime. We need to address this as a type of crime. However, other theories cannot explain white-collar crime, and because of that, they cannot possibly be good theories due to this lack of scope. If you think about it, biological theories suggested that people were biologically different and unfit for civilized society. That doesn't really explain – white collar offending because how could you get to these powerful positions if you were unfit for society psychological theory suggested that there was something wrong in the individual psyche well that doesn't make sense how could you be so successful in business to get this power and this wealth if you had a, a kind of a psychological defect a strain theory suggests that uh when you experience strain in your life right it's specifically like lower class strain um you will commit deviance. Well, that doesn't really work for white collar uh, offending. Social disorganization, it, the social environment of living in poverty. Well, that doesn't explain it. Um, uh, uh, control theories, you, you have a lack of control, self-control, or, or uh, bonds to society. Well, that doesn't seem to make sense for businesses either, right? And so Sutherland said, we need to propose a new theory to kind of address these white collar offending. And this theory is differential association. And the basic idea here is that crime is learned behavior from those around you, specifically how you define certain actions as deviant or not. So in street crime, you learn crime from other street youth. And in businesses, you learn crime from other businessmen. If you think that other businessmen are not following the rules of business or the rules that govern um, how you should operate a business, what incentive is there for you to follow the rules to operate the business? The same thing is true, right, in in uh, sports. If you're a head coach and you think that everyone else is giving their athletes steroids to play better, why wouldn't you give your athletes steroids, right? In order to stay competitive, you almost feel like you have to commit deviance. And so you learn this deviant behavior from those around you. This uses differential association in conjunction with social disorganization such that the community of businessmen does not fight against these business crimes. And so, so there's this idea that, that the business community is its own society and they, in general, are socially disorganized such that they don't actually fight against these business crimes themselves. So what was Sutherland's basic argument here? What he was arguing is that white-collar crime is real crime. Not only is it real crime, but it differs from real crime in implementation of the criminal law. And here's where this kind of sociology of law element ties in. And specifically, you can see Sutherland kind of has this leaning toward a conflict uh, approach to, to law creation here, right? Basically, those in power are making the laws, and so white-collar crime differs from this real crime or street crime in their implementation because those in power don't allow the implementation to take place. He also suggests that current theories of crime are wrong, and a new theory is needed to explain both types of crime. So, differential association paired with social disorganization may be that new theory to help explain both crime types. So, in a nutshell, that was Sutherland's basic argument. When we come back, we're going to see what others who argued with Sutherland thought of this, and whether or not they thought that Sutherland was wrong in this definition of crime. So tune back in to find out the arguments against white-collar crime.